she was a Hollywood and Broadway sensation, but captured the biggest audience of her career as a TV sleuth. Her award-honored acting career lasted for an astonishing 80 years, yet her signature role came to her when she was in her late 50s. In this video you will learn about the life path of the actress who gained enormous popularity among TV audiences from across the world as a normative sleuth, Jessica Fletcher from Murder, she wrote. This is the ever-inspiring story of Angela Lansbury. Hello, cousin. Welcome to London. Remember that fall of 2022, Queen Elizabeth died in September, being 96 years old. And then a month later, in October, we heard the sad news of Dame Angela Lansbury passing away just five days shy of her 97th birthday. Incredible, both women lived almost a century long life, being not only witnesses, but active participants and the driving force of this world changing at an incredible pace. Who's someone from history you wish you could take to lunch? The Queen of England. Angela Lansbury was one of those trailblazing actresses who sustained a particularly versatile career. From black and white movies to theatre stage to big screens, cartoons and TV productions that made her almost a member of a family for millions of people in the world. It was a result of perseverance and hard work, although she did have some initial boost right from the beginning. Gossip. I prefer to call it a healthy interest in human nature. <laughs> Angela Bridget Lansbury was born back in 1925 in an English-British family. Her father, Edgar, was a timber merchant and politician who was the son of a Labour Party leader, George Lansbury. Angela's mother was no stranger to acting. Belfast-born Moina McGill was a regular in West End shows and occasionally appeared in films opposite the great leading man of the day. Angela's first performance happened at about the age of six. Well, just like many kids of her epoch, together with her sister, they were very enthusiastic about the home theatricals. Angela recalled that she just loved this make-believe. And since her mother was an actress herself, no one objected to her serious involvement in this field. She exposed me to theatre as a child. She took me to see the greats in London. Mm -hmm. She just very gently kind of fed me an awful lot of stuff. She also gave me pocket money which allowed me to go to the movies and I spent a tremendous amount of my young life at the movies. <laughs> she was educated at South Hampstead High School for Girls as well as trained at the Webb Douglas Academy of Dramatic Art. It was there that Angela played her first stage role in a school production of Maxwell Anderson's Mary of Scotland. Then in 1940 Following the deaths of her father and grandfather, the 14-year-old Angela and her twin younger brothers, together with their mother, were evacuated to the United States, fleeing the wartime London during the Blitz. There, she continued her education in New York's Fagan School of Dramatic Art. While her mother toured Canada in a variety show for the troops, Angela did cabaret turns in Monroe. When Moina's agent sent her to Hollywood for an audition, she decided to move the children out there with her. Unlike the heroines of my previous videos from the series about the great actors of the past, Margaret Rutherford and John Hickson, Angela Lansbury wasn't a late bloomer. Imagine, she got her first Oscar nomination already at the age of 18. Her role as Charles Boyer's cheeky cockney maid in the 1944 Gaslight thriller movie directed by George Cukor brought her early fame and high critical acclaim, which turned into the Academy nomination as the best supporting actress playing opposite Ingrid Bergman. She's a tartar, isn't she? What do you mean by that? 
Or, you know, strict lock. In fact, it is believed that this hit introduced the term gaslighting as a name for the sort of malicious manipulation like the one depicted in the movie. Gregory, are you trying to tell me I'm insane? It's what I'm trying not to tell myself. It also brought Lansbury a contract with MGM. Imagine, when she arrived in LA, she earned $28 a week as a clerk in a big department store. Now, aged 18, she was on a $500 per week, seven-year contract with a huge studio. I, I had not been around the block. I didn't have boyfriends. I didn't know anything. And yet here was this woman, you know, <laughs> this girl, because I was only 17, behaving as if, you know, I knew it all. I didn't. But I knew how to act knowing it all. It didn't take long until her second successful appearance on screens in the 1945 black and white movie adaptation of Oscar Wilde's classic novel The Picture of Dorian Gray. There she played dance hall girl and tavern singer Sybil Thane, who falls in love with the key protagonist Dorian Gray. This wasn't a key female role. The whole acting is mostly based on her ability to convey feelings with her eyes and presence only, and yet she once again catches the attention of the critics and again gets a nomination for Oscar's second year in a row, as well as the well-deserved award as the Best Supporting Actress with the Golden Globe. It's wonderful. Did, did you write it? Frédéric Chopin wrote it. For a woman he loved. Her name was Georges Saint. This successful debut led the pathway to her highly acclaimed career, which would last for almost eight decades. I only come alive as an interesting person, in my estimation, when I'm acting, because I can take on all kinds of physical, emotional attributes which I personally don't have. I'm an empty vessel, I'm very straightforward, plain thinking, doing person, but I fill myself with all of these things that create a character. And that to me is the fun of being an actor is you're not yourself, you're 50 different people and you take these people and you use them and characterize an individual. Being somebody else is the greatest thing in the world because you don't have to really let on who I am. Have you noticed that early on she was noted for her performance as a supporting actress? This is another stroke of her wide acting range from drama to comedy. Thanks to that, she managed to avoid the main peril in female acting career. Having emerged typecast as the ingenue, she managed to gradually evolve into a more motherly and mature figure. The seamless transition is a rather rare achievement on its own. In the vids about John Hickson and Margaret Rutherford, we spoke a lot about this dual nature of being typecast as a female actor and how hugely it impacted actresses' careers in the 20th century. Well, Angela Lansbury could have joined their chorus regarding that matter. For those women who were lovely, were known for their beauty and so on, it is darn difficult. But I was playing all the parts when I was terribly young because I wasn't a big screen beauty. A rather harsh assessment, I'd say, but obviously she knew it better. I can say this in all honesty, I was too good an actress. I was primarily an actress and not a pretty face. Perhaps Lansbury didn't follow the path of a leading lady deliberately, though had such an opportunity. I wasn't very good at being a starlet, she said. I didn't want to pose for cheesecake photos and that kind of thing. I didn't think of myself as being pretty or beautiful, certainly not that. I, I was absolutely surrounded at MGM with beautiful little girls, you know, all small, cute, perky, D delightful. Somebody, somebody once said, uh, 
that I, uh, that I had a face like a bread pudding with black widows for eyes. <laughs> Somehow, MGM followed that self-assessment of the actress and regularly cast her as an older woman or a nasty one. Lansbury wasn't particularly keen on those years as a contract actress, since she had no voice in choosing which roles to play and which to avoid. So, yeah, she had to put on a mask and do what she was told to do. The movie community in this town, I don't think they've ever, to this day, really known how to use me. Even after that contract expired, and in the early 50s, Lansbury returned to the movies as a freelance actress, she again found herself cast as either of two types, as she put it, bitches on wheels and people's mothers. Who's that? It's Mabel Claremont and her daughter. She's Sheila's second cousin, twice removed, and twice isn't far enough. Why? What's wrong with her? I think she looks like fun. Well, she is really, but Jimmy thinks she talks a bit too much. Her tongue runs on atomic energy. In 1956, at the age of 31, she appeared in Vicente Minnelli's movie The Reluctant Debutante as an overbearing mother. In 1961, she became Elvis Presley's possessive mother in Blue Hawaii. And you're going to have a responsible position with a great southern Hawaiian fruit company. And you're going to marry a girl of your own class and be a gentleman like your daddy. <coughs> she was Lawrence Harvey's sinister mother in The Manchurian Candidate, a political puppet master who commands her own brainwashed son to shoot the presidential nominee through the head. Hilariously, being only 36, she was only three years senior, her movie's son, who was in fact 33. Hollywood made me old before my time, she would say later. I'm not going home with your mother. I'm going to New York. What? I've got a job in a newspaper. Research assistant to Mr. Hoban Gaines. That communist? What could you possibly have in common with that dreadful old man? By the way, the Manchurian Candidate is often regarded as one of Lansbury's best screen performances. No wonder that the role of politically committed villainess Eleanor Iselin earned her third Oscar nomination. You were a favorite to win the Oscar for a supporting actress that year. And you didn't that night. It went to Patty Duke in The Miracle Worker. That, that was a night that I wouldn't want to have to live through again. <laughs> As a sort of parallel track, she perfected her craft in theatre. In 1957, she made her Broadway debut playing the wife of Bert Lahr in Hotel Paradiso, a translation of a 19th century French farce. In 1960, she returned to the New York stage as the alcoholic single mother of a pregnant teenager in A Taste of Honey. And most significantly, Cora Hoover Hoover, the corrupt mayoress in the 1964 stage musical Anyone Can Whistle. The show was a flop and closed in a week, but Lansbury came out of it with flying colors, praised by critics for her agility and engaging personality, which opened her the doors of musical productions. I was ready for it. It was everything that I had envisioned for myself accomplishing in the musical theater. Her first Tony Award came in 1966 for MAME, the Jerry Herman's musical adaptation of Patrick Dennis's novel Auntie MAME. Lansbury was chosen among the beloved Hollywood stars of the epoch. In fact, she was 41 years old, and it was her first leading role. As a result, as she became an iconic incarnation of Auntie Mame, a free-spirited woman who picks herself off the floor on the stock market crash and ultimately recoups her fortunes by marrying a southern aristocrat. Many critics believe that it was this performance that finally secured her an undisputed stardom. I thought, oh gosh, this is it. This is what I really want to be doing. This is what I'm going to really love to do one day. And I really visualize myself doing it. 
until I did. I found myself up on the stage playing Mae. Following that success, Lansbury went on to win her second Tony for Best Actress as the 75-year-old Countess Aurelia in Dear World, a 1969 musical adaptation of The Mad Woman of Chaillot, in which, as one critic noted, she appeared to be dressed in a wedding cake made of cobwebs. In 1971, she starred in her first Disney movie, the musical comedy Bad Knobs and Broomsticks, as a witch in training Eglantine Price. This was her first lead in a screen musical, which turned to be a big commercial success, securing her an enormous audience, as Angela put it herself. Maybe she's not a wicked witch. Of course I'm not. See? You see, the work I'm doing is so important to the war effort. Her parts as Mama Rose in the 1974 revival of Gypsy and Mrs. Lovett, the baker with a grisly sauce of meat for her pies in 1979, Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street, also became stage successes, bringing Lansbury the third and the fourth Tony Awards, respectively. Where I'd really like to go in a year or so don't you want to know of course do you really want to know yes yes i do i do well i've always had this dream what a life in the limelight huh well, one could think the destiny was too kind to her and that an actress of her magnitude and fame might have been a rather complicated person in private life, wasn't she? Forget that. Real people who have real talent, who have earned their stars, do not do those things. I'm sorry. It is only people who have no self-confidence and no real talent who indulge in that kind of ridiculous behavior. I have no time for it whatsoever. Well, to tell the truth, Angela had her fair share of luck in her personal life too. In 1949, she married the MGM executive and former actor Peter Shaw. A teenage mistake marriage to Richard Cromwell, an American actor almost twice her older, ended in divorce after only nine months on friendly terms. But it was not possible because he was a gay man and therefore he, w he walked away from it. And I was absolutely, oh, I mean, it was like the end of my life when, when that happened. So it was a terrible, terrible shock to me. By 1970, Shaw and Lansbury were living in a happy marriage in California, raising their two kids and Shaw's son from the previous marriage. When he came into my life, on a blind date, we, we, just, we just kind of locked emotionally together and uh, we never looked back. But perhaps destiny was laying it on a bit too thick. Suddenly, their Malibu house was destroyed in a brush fire and her two kids were using hard drugs. And in addition, her daughter had been in with a crowd led by Charles Manson. Don't all the accolades pale in significance when your children are in trouble. To save the family, Lansbury and Shaw decided to leave California for the coast of County Cork in Ireland, where they built a home based on traditional farmhouse design. I was drawn to Ireland because it was the birthplace of my mother, and it was also somewhere my children wouldn't be exposed to any more bad influences, said the actress. I refused all work for a year and simply kept house. My life, in a sense, has always been kind of divided into two parts, uh, family and uh, career. Uh, the sad part in my mind was that I didn't succeed particularly well. Uh, the family suffered, the career soared. Luckily, this total change of the decorations worked. Lansbury's kids overcame their addictions and were able to get on much more rewarding life paths. And Angela, in turn, found the ever-elusive peace and joy of a private life. 
I was very shy, very trepidatious about moving into the stream of Hollywood social life. I really don't know how to play that scene. There, in Ireland, she became a navid gardener and passionate cook. I'm very family-oriented, the actress said in 1987. One of my family's favorites is a parsnip cheesecake made with only fresh herbs. I'm not an exotic cook. I mean, I don't cook Chinese food. I cook what I like, a lot of healthy food. I'm the happiest in my garden and kitchen, being boring as ever. There, in County Cork, they would spend two months each year while maintaining family home in Los Angeles. Yet let's get back to her career. There are so many things to say and we're just barely scratching the surface of her versatile talent. Before Murder, she wrote, she appeared in a couple of starry film roles where she tested the water of the detective mystery genre. This way, one of the pearls of the 1978 Death on the Nile was her part of Salome Autobahn. Somehow I don't think Monsieur Poirot is a very keen reader of romantic novels, Mother. Mm, of course he is. Oh, Frenchmen are. They're not afraid of good, strong sex. Unlike, I might say, most of our leading lending libraries. This is one of my favorite films, perhaps the favorite Poirot movie, with a mind-blowing cast with Peter Steinoff as Hercule Poirot, David Neven, Pat Davis, Mia Farrow and Maggie Smith. Mr. Doyle, I tell you that I, Salome Ottobal, have succeeded where frail men have faltered. I am a finer sleuth than even the great Hercule Poirot. Mrs. Ottobal, for God's sake, calm down! By the way, a curious fact, Angela's elder half-sister, Isolde Denham, was Peter Steinoff's first wife. In 1980, Lansbury continued her engagement with Agatha Christie's screen adaptations and now put on Miss Marble's head for the movie version of The Mirror Cracked, playing alongside Elizabeth Taylor, Kim Novak, Tony Curtis and Rock Hudson. Well, show business is just a business, Aunt Jane. What we need is a little more business and a little less show. Apart from numerous Oscar nominations, Golden Globe and Tony Awards, she also landed a Grammy nom for Album of the Year for Beauty and the Best. Indeed, Lansbury's exceptionally charming and soothing voice when she talks and sings alike made her an icon of musicals and voice-over parts in cartoons. That's me. Then a quick rehearsal of the lyrics and the tune. What do all these scribbles really mean? La 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 la. I've sung from the day I cut out of my crib. I think I've been singing. The 90s marked her debut as the voiceover actress in animated movies, which again brought her universal acclaim for her nuanced vocal delivery. In 1991, Beauty and the Beast, she played the role of the teapot, iconic, wisecracking, heart on her sleeve, Mrs. Potts. There is a curious true story fact that she delivered the famous romantic ballad, Tale as Old as Time, in just one take. I don't know how. Well, you can start by making yourself more presentable. Straighten up. Try to act like a gentleman. Critics were in awe of Angela's voice acting performances and soon she went on to voice Mrs. Potts in Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas from 1997, as well as the video game Kingdom Hearts II in 2006. She cemented her success with the role of Dowager Empress of Russia, mother of Nicholas II and the beloved granny of the Grand Duchess Anastasia in the eponymous animated movie by David Bloth, released in 1997 by 20th Century Fox. Like, who doesn't remember her soothing voice when she sang the lullaby to Anastasia in Once Upon the December? In fact, I have three videos on my channel dedicated to the characters of the film, so check them out if you want to learn more about the epoch and its heroes. For 
those who grew up in the 90s, it's highly likely that murder, she wrote, was a mainstay in your houses. Well, that was certainly my case. I remembered my grandmother watching the show and, yeah, I often dived into this together with her. Isn't it a special treat to rewatch an episode or two from time to time? Uh, well, my name is Jessica Fletcher. I'm very anxious. Jessica Fletcher. The author, Jessica Fletcher. Well, yes. Mrs. Fletcher, this is a delightful and unexpected pleasure. I've read most all your books. Premiering in 1984, the CBS series Murder, She Wrote ran for 12 seasons, up until 1996. Angela Lansbury played the lead role of Jessica Fletcher, a mystery writer who lived in the small coastal town of Cabot Cove in Maine and seemed to constantly bump into murders here and there, traveling all over the United States. The actress was 59 years old and the engagement was her TV series debut. I am a character actress. Um, first and foremost, <clears throat> although the one area that I was not a character actress, really, was playing Jessica Fletcher. Attempting to bring off my own show is a great challenge. If I can do it at the age of 59, it will be a small miracle. I felt that it would have been a gap in my acting experience if I had never done a television series. I wanted to play to that huge audience just once. And what a huge audience it was! At the height of its popularity, the series drew more than 40 million viewers each week. But are you sure these aren't just accidents? Three incidents on three successive weekends? <laughs> Not likely, love. What appealed to me about Jessica Fletcher, recalled Lansbury, is that I could do what I do best and have little chance to play, a sincere, down-to-earth woman. In the original concept, Jessica Fletcher was probably a little bit more eccentric and had general characteristics of an older woman. I wanted to eradicate that aspect of her and make her more kind of ready for the world. The series became a dictionary illustration for the genre of cozy mystery. Cozy mysteries are usually set in a small town and feature a murder or mystery to be solved by someone who isn't technically qualified. There is always a norm to sleuth like Jessica Fletcher or Miss Marple or think of the fabulous trio from Only Murders in the Building. Then there is also a group of friends who support the home-brewed detective with some bits of evidence and ideas. There are police officials who get irritated by this unwanted interference of a rookie detective, as they think, and yeah, the criminal himself or herself doesn't notice the sniffing out going around, since no one believes this main detective character is capable of finding the truth. In other words, the action was set around the characters, human nature and personal conflicts, and not so with the complexity of the intricate murder riddle. Jess, uh, why am I getting the creepy feeling you're putting your pretty head into something that might be dangerous? No, don't pretty head me, Terwilliger. Anyway, you know me better than that. Though clearly inspired in one way or another by Agatha Christie's Miss Marple, her American counterpart is the Guinness world record holder as the most prolific amateur sleuth. Well, of course, Jane Marple has been on and off screen for longer in terms of decades, yet Jessica Fletcher has cracked way more cases, appearing in 264 episodes in total. Amusingly, for this reason, some fans even elaborated a theory that Jessica Fletcher herself was a serious killer. Like, she needs crimes for her books. So, yeah, has to roll up the sleeves and do it herself sometimes. What happened? It's the fish. They've been poisoned. 
Unlike Agatha Christie's mysteries, which were born as books and then moved onto the stage and later on movie screens and TV, murder, she wrote, adventures gravitated in the opposite direction and after the tremendous success of the TV series, moved on to the bookshops and brick and mortar stores. This way, the fictional writer Jessica Fletcher sort of became the real-life author of her cozy mysteries. You see? It's me! It's particularly amusing to note, yet the producers weren't hoping for basically any success for the series. And yet, the show became a huge hit. Angela Lansbury received 12 successive Emmy nominations for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Drama Series for her portrayal of Jessica Fletcher, but unfortunately she never won. Luckily, it didn't diminish the public's love for the show and the character of Jessica Fletcher, and already after the series' final curtain, Lansbury returned to her signature role in four made-for-television murder she wrote films. Look, Brita, here's a Celtic inscription. It says, happiness comes to all those who cherish others. Hmm. To sum it up, isn't it remarkable that Angela Lansbury was indeed an ambitious woman and actress? She was always full of energy, always keeping in mind that she was there to strive for more. A small number of people have seen me on the stage. Television is a chance for me to play to a vast US public, and I think that's a chance you don't pass up. I'm interested in reaching everybody. I don't want to reach just the people who can pay 45 or 50 dollars for a theater seat. The years after the murder she wrote corresponded with the personal drama for the actress. Her husband of 53 years, Peter Shaw, died in 2003. A true soulmate and a partner in crime for Lansbury. She was devastated and said later that with his death she lost all heart. Luckily, it was the call of the Broadway stage and participation in Emma Thompson's hit children's film Nanny McPhee that pulled her out of the abyss and saved her. In the 21st century, after she became a household name in movies and TV, she decided to get back to basics and return to the West End stage in Noel Coward's blithe spirit. Now, tell me, is there anyone there who wishes to speak to anyone here? Time is the reef upon which all our frail mystic ships are wrecked. Well, this quote of Madame Arcati seemed to never apply to Lansbury herself. Neither Arthritis nor Heap and knee replacements stopped Lansbury from her engagements resulting in remarkable performances. <laughs> In 2009, when she was in her mid-80s, she received her fifth Tony for Madame Arcati. I thoroughly enjoyed playing Madame Arcati. Uh, she was a wonderful character. And then it came the time for honorary awards. In 2014, Angela received the well-deserved Oscar for creating some of the cinema's most memorable characters and inspiring generations of actors. A year later, she was made a Dame Commander of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II. And finally, in 2022, followed her sixth Tony for lifetime achievement in theatre, another testament to her extraordinary stamina. I'm kind of interested and amazed too that I managed to kind of compartmentalize my career in such a way that it's in really three parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you take each separately, there are those uh, in, in uh, the audience who don't know that I was in the first section mm -hmm. and those who don't know that I was in the second section, right. but they only know me from the third section. Interesting. So it's kind of extraordinary. But wait, there is more. In 2018, when she was 93, 
BBC released their miniseries Little Women, where Lansbury masterfully played the rich, imperious Aunt March. The same year, she appeared in the Disney's Mary Poppins Returns in the role of the Balloon Lady, an old woman who was friends with Mary Poppins, whose balloons she sells in the park have the magical ability to take on the name of their new owner. In the trailer, she can be seen speaking to an adult Michael Banks, reminding him of the importance of keeping hold of a childlike quality inside. The quintessential message of the Mary Poppins tales, so true to Lansbury herself. I really don't know how to relax to the degree that I could just stop, she said in 2009. So when something comes along and is presented to me and I think, gee, I could have had some fun doing that or I think I could bring something to that, I'll do it. I've had been given so many opportunities by people, not me, directors, producers, writers, who say, I would like her to play that role. And it was those people that I thank, am so thankful to. Indeed, despite such a prolific and, yes, quite a rewarding career, she was still looking ahead, being the living example of the motto that the best is yet to come. There was one thing she was still missing after all those years. I'd like to do one great movie before I pass along the way. I don't know what it'll be, but I think... There is one out there, somewhere. My bones are often racked up. They often act up each time it rains. But my arthritis and my phlebitis are simply growing pains. <laughs> and that's the way I feel. <laughs> all in all, she took part in 122 movies. The trajectory of her career progressed from ingenue to maternal figure to grandmother-type roles. Another proof that you may come across your sweet spot at any age, and it's never too late to explore new things that may lead to the most rewarding discoveries. And what a providence of fate! As if in a nod to her most famous character, Jessica Fletcher, Lansbury's final screen appearance turned out to be a cameo in Knives Out who done its sequel Glass Onion, released shortly after her death in November 2022. I saw you go in the engine room. You're the imposter. We all know it. Case closed. We're done. I don't understand this at all. So Angie caught me. I'd like to be remembered as somebody who entertained, who took one out of oneself. For a few minutes, a few hours, transported you into a different venue, gave you relief, gave you entertainment, and gave you joy and laughter and tears, all those things. I would like to be remembered as somebody who was capable of doing that. Thank you for tuning in to this episode about the great actors of the past. I hope it was a time well spent. Take care and see you in my other videos.